Welcome to The Explainer. For decades, we've all been prescribing metformin thinking we understood it. We've thought its primary action was in the liver and the gut. But what if the main event, the real therapeutic action, is actually happening somewhere else entirely, in the brain? Some pretty incredible new research is forcing us to rethink everything we thought we knew. Look, metformin is the absolute cornerstone of type 2 diabetes treatment. It's a workhorse. We've all relied on it for years, and we've seen it work in our patients. But as this quote points out, the real story of how it works has always been a little murky, a bit controversial. Well, a recent study suggests we've been missing a huge piece of the puzzle, and that piece points directly to the central nervous system. So here's how we're going to break this down. We'll start with a textbook story we all learned. Then we'll get into a puzzling case of resistance that just didn't add up. We'll follow the clues that led researchers right into the brain and to a very specific neural pathway. And this is crucial. We'll look at why the dose we use in the clinic matters so much. And then we'll wrap up by rethinking what this all means for us. Okay, let's dive in. All right, so as clinicians, we are all intimately familiar with a classic model of how metformin works. You know, it's the one we learned in medical school, the one that's still in all the literature. Yeah, this is the textbook story, right? Metformin is a peripheral agent. It works on the liver, it works on the gut, and the key pathway is AMP-activated protein kinase, or AMPK. That's been the consensus model for years. But what if that's not the primary mechanism at the doses we're actually using in our patients every single day? So this is where it gets really interesting. This entire investigation kicked off because of a perplexing observation in a very specific group of lab mice. It was an anomaly that just didn't fit with that conventional model at all. The investigation focused on these mice that were specially engineered. They were missing a protein called RAP1, but, and this is the key part, it was knocked out only in their forebrain neurons. Now, RAP1 was already known to have a role in glucose metabolism, but what happened with this specific knockout? Well, it produced a really striking and highly specific kind of drug resistance. And here's the bombshell. The research team gave metformin to hyperglycemic control mice, and they saw exactly what you'd expect. Blood glucose went down significantly. But then, they gave the same dose to the mice that were missing RAP1 in their brains, and basically nothing happened. The drug was completely ineffective. Now, this is crucial. This resistance was totally specific to metformin. These same mice, the ones that didn't respond to metformin, they responded perfectly normally to other classes of anti-diabetic drugs, a sulfonylurea, a GLP-1 agonist, a TZD. So this wasn't some general problem with their ability to regulate glucose. It was a metformin-specific problem. And that's really the heart of it. The problem wasn't the mice. It was a highly selective inability to respond to metformin. This was a massive clue, strongly suggesting that for metformin to do its job, that RAP1 protein inside the brain had to be present and working. This discovery just led to a pretty radical question. I mean, if knocking out a protein that's in the brain completely blocks metformin's effect, could it be that the drug is actually acting directly on the brain itself instead of in the periphery like we've always thought? The results here were just striking. The team injected a tiny microdose of metformin, a dose so small that it had zero effect when they gave it peripherally and they put it directly into the brain. And the effect? A significant sustained drop in blood glucose. This was the smoking gun. It was the first direct piece of evidence that the brain isn't just a bystander, it's a primary target. So once they established that metformin acts on the brain, the next logical step was to zero in on the exact location and the specific mechanism. Where is this happening? And, and they uncovered this remarkably clear causal chain. So, metformin crosses the blood-brain barrier and it gets to the hypothalamus. Once there, it inhibits the activity of that key protein we've been talking about, RAP1. This action happens specifically in the ventromedial hypothalamus, the VMH, and it activates a special set of neurons called SF1 neurons. It is these activated neurons that then send the signal out to the rest of the body to lower blood glucose. Okay. This brings us to what is maybe the most important part of this whole discovery for us as practitioners. This is the key clinical takeaway, because this is where this new model connects directly to your practice, and it all hinges on the dose. You know, the researchers were incredibly careful about differentiating between the doses we actually use in our patients, the ones that result in serum levels around 10 to 40 micromolar, and the much, much higher super pharmacological doses that are often used in lab experiments. And that distinction, it turns out, is absolutely critical. This table just lays out the two different stories of metformin perfectly. At the low, clinical doses that we prescribe, the primary site of action is the brain, through RAP1 inhibition. 
Now, the classic peripheral mechanisms we all learned about, the liver, the gut, AMPK, they're not wrong, but they seem to require those super high experimental doses to really kick in. So at those high concentrations, the peripheral effects probably just overwhelm this more sensitive neural pathway. So just how sensitive is this neural pathway? Well, the study found that the brain needs a dose that is over 1,000 times lower than what peripheral tissues need to get a similar glucose-lowering effect. I mean, it's an exquisite sensitivity, and it explains how that small amount of metformin that actually makes it across the blood-brain barrier can have such a profound clinical impact. So what does all this mean? How should we now think about the number one drug for type 2 diabetes? Well, it really requires a pretty fundamental shift in our perspective. So here are the key takeaways for your practice. This research really proposes a whole new model. At the therapeutic doses we use, metformin's primary effect starts in the brain. Those well-established liver and gut mechanisms aren't wiped away, but they're recontextualized. They're likely secondary, or maybe only dominant at those higher non-clinical concentrations. This new neural framework could finally help explain the variability we all see in how our patients respond, and it identifies this vmh rap one pathway as a powerful new therapeutic target for the future. This discovery really just changes our view of an old, familiar drug. It pushes us to see the central nervous system not just as an organ that suffers the complications of diabetes, but as a primary, powerful, and targetable regulator of the body's entire glucose balance. It's a true paradigm shift. And it opens up an entirely new frontier for glycemic control. 